Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I know it's a good song. <laughs> but one thing about music, when it hits you, you feel no pain. So hit me, hit me with music. That's sort of a mantra in my life. Because music has lent, meant a lot to me. And it's not always a private experience. Myself and many others, it starts as this really multi-layered relationship. It begins with sort of this internal drive, and then it progresses into group process, and then it builds into community that of, consists of these really various souls with one common factor, is that when the music hits, you feel no pain. I am so much better in this in my house. Anyway, Bob Marley, among so many others, when you're thinking of music as social justice. They utilize their gift and their profound ability to speak about the injustices in their worlds, and in his case, he was able to influence elections. He had that quality of being able to use the lyrics and his music to reach out to so many others. Stevie Wonder, did not just write a song about happy birthday. It was a lobbying demand to make sure that Dr. Martin Luther King had a national holiday. And with every concert, with every public appearance, he moved public opinion. And because of that, in 1981, we are able to reflect today on Dr. King's work on a day off, but also to think about all the great things of social justice Dr. King accomplished in his way too short life. Let's see. Music is therapy. And with therapy, pers like those personal songs that just make you feel good, those lyrics that hit an emotion or a mood at any time, they're wonderful and it can kind of do the quick fix. It's like, okay, this is my frustration, this is how I'm sad, listen to a sad song, that Elton John song is awesome for that. But we're social workers. Quick fixes don't really hit us too well. So, as much as I want to encourage us to consider music as part of micro practice, of micro or one-to-one -one individual, I want you to think about something else. For this brief time, I want you to imagine the last time you went to a live music performance. Why did you go? Was it, was it because you just wanted to buy overpriced merchandise? Where did you go? Was the venue like a big arena? Was it an intimate jazz club? Was it a venue with sticky floors, which is one of my personal favorites? Were you forced to go by a partner or a friend? Or was it because the song, the artist, the album is just so special to you that it was worth the time, the effort, and the money to travel, to go, and experience this performance? Now, I want you to think about that moment when that artist, band, musician, whoever, played your song. You know the one I'm talking about, your song. Think about that second, whatever that elation may be, whatever that emotion might be. And if you can think about yourself in that concert space at this time, take a look at the ones around you do they have that same look on their face? Are they smiling or feeling the same way? Do they give you that wink and that nod of like, yep, 
He's playing it, and that smile as you bob your head, and you feel so good because, wow, I'm here with people who get it. Well, in clinical terms, that is known as affiliative social engagement. But for non-clinical terms, it's a vibe. <laughs> Music is community. Now, even in a live performance, whether it's concerts, small, it's this way of finding those common spaces, that way to bond. And the importance of that, when you think about our world right now, when you think about our cities, gentrification, the inequalities of economy, and the unfairness of just education, COVID, you realize that, yeah, people suffer, but they endure. But we need respite from that. We need that time to see our friends, to see our neighbors, to smile, to dance, to laugh, to enjoy, and just feel that unification as a whole, just to be together. And there have been some really brilliant historical moments when that community practice utilizing music has worked well. Some of those examples include the Harlem Cultural Festival in 1969. You may know it as the Summer of Soul because of this wonderful documentary that came out. But the Harlem Cultural Festival took place over six weeks in the summer. About 300,000 people were there, and it was in lovely Harlem, in Marcus Garvey Park. And in this time, we got to see Stevie Wonder, Nina Simone, Sly and the Family Stone, who actually showed up for a change. All of these people were part of this wonderful thing, and it was protected by the Black Panthers. And if something had went wrong, we would have remembered this event. <laughs> That's for sure. But the most important thing is that in this time, a year earlier, we lost Dr. King. We lost Robert Kennedy. There was ongoing riots and violence. So to have this moment, this time, this summer, when people not only were celebrating here, there was also Woodstock, and there was also the moon landing in that same summer. This was a time, if you took the A train, if you lived in New York, to head uptown and have this wonderful, soulful gathering, which encouraged a lot of healing. In Watt Stacks, 1972 concert, this was a benefit which encouraged the support of the Watts community in Los Angeles, which was absolutely decimated during the riots a few years earlier. Now, in this time, Stax Records had all of their artists come out, play for free, charged $1 to see Isaac Hayes, the Bar Hayes, Staple Singers, and $73,000 from that concert went directly back to Watts for healthcare and education programs. Think about Lollapalooza. Okay, mostly I think about it because of the Red Hot Chili Peppers, but that's a whole other story. But they encouraged people to, and I quote the great um, philosopher Jimi Hendrix here, let their freak flags fly high. And sometimes that's all you need. Now music is creates community. Now, for people of color, like myself and many others, punk music did not fit the mold, but we really liked it. And because it connected in a way of like, I want to be angry, but I want to do this fast, three minutes, bam, 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 we're done. But we often were not considered welcome to go to venues to experience it and to enjoy it. And that was frustrating. And then I realized that there were bands like Bad Brains, 24-7 Spies, Fishbone, who were absolutely doing the same thing and saying, you know what, black people are angry too. And we're frustrated with the world and we have something to say and we can do it just as loud and just as hard and under three minutes. So circling back really quick to Bob Marley, who did not like punk music that much, 
but he did have the opportunity to speak with Don Letts, who was a young black British DJ at the time, and who was really there to debate and speak about the values of punk rock music. And a couple months later, Punky Reggae Party came out. So he had some influence there too. But then you saw bands like The Clash and Big Audio Dynamite really incorporate reggae into, into their music and sound to really speak about social justice and economic justice and rights. And it eventually led to Bob Geldof and Band-Aid and Live Aid. Meanwhile, Bad Brains was also incorporating reggae into their sound, but they were doing it to encourage righteousness and enlightenment, actually calming down. And there they are, a beautiful DC band, and I thought it was important for us to celebrate a band in DC. <laughs> now, in this time, there was also people that were looking for this immediate feeling, and James Spooner came with Afropunk in 2003 to encourage everyone to realize that out of these ones, there were many. And that is the purpose of community. Now, music is social work. And the reality is that if we are willing to look at various ways to take on this beautiful eclectic profession that we have, taken, that we have elected to be part of, we can find innovative ways and access to reach out to others, individuals, communities, and societies, one note and one beat at a time. Thank you. <laughs>